All right. I think Alistair has given a brief uh, introduction about myself. Just to add, yeah, and I've, out of the 30 years that you mentioned, I've got about 25 years experience in timber engineering, ranging from truss and frame to engineered timber, and now a bit of offsite construction as well. So I work for, work for my timber now. I, I joined in 2019, and they are basically, they are a family owned company um, established in 1975. And they're one of the largest, uh, largest uh, timber wholesale distributors in Australia, operating in Victoria, uh, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and Tasmania. And they have now grown to become a complete solutions provider rather than just being a mere timber distributor. And the focus is on adding value to the product they supply. Okay. Um, yeah, this, uh, today's topic will be on bracing. Um, looking at design specification and detailing, um, basically looking at uh, the, I mean, what A1684 uh, specifies, and also uh, looking at the experiences that I've gained over the years and how to, how to use those functions effectively. So the topics that we cover today will be uh, basically to understand the boundaries and geometric limits of A1684, and also to explore the bracing challenges in a modern house. And then we'll look at um, the, you know, the, wind, you know, wind classifications and, and the loading on structures and, uh, and also to understand the load path. And I'll probably focus a bit on the load path because, because the, uh, sort of the crux of the bracing system is actually depends on the load path and the components within that. And then we'll look at the bracing systems, um, what is specified in A1684, what is available in the market, and also to look at alternate systems. And then we'll look at the distribution and connections part of it. These are basically important links in the load path. And, and also talk about the fundamental rules that makes a basic system work. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I'll talk a little bit on temporary basing, which is often not designed by a designer per se, but all the same, it's a very important topic to discuss. And uh, often when it is disregarded, we see serious issues on site. Um, so I'll start with the scope. Now this was covered in the previous session by Lex, but just to recap and to put it in the context of bracing, um, yep, class one, 10A building, uh, single or two-story construction, building shapes, can be rectangle, square, L shape, or a combination of them. Um, maximum wall height um, is given as three meters, but that's measured at a common external wall. Uh, and also the code permits up to 3.6 meters, where, where appropriate consideration is given to the effect of the increased wall height on, on racking forces, bracing wall capacities, et cetera. And then final one, um, and also there are so geometric uh, heights that are applicable to the, the wind loading code uh, that you'll be using. Yeah, the, cool. the A1684 allows, allows two pathways to uh, determine the wind classification. We'll, you know, we'll look, look at that shortly. But within that, if you're using AS, AS4055, then um, there, is, there are other geometric limits that you have to satisfy as well. Um, and then uh, spacing or bracing walls is another, uh, another limitation in uh, A1684, uh, which is obviously directly connected to wall bracing. Um, and uh, we, will, we will look at that as well. That's <clears throat> an effective structural ceiling roof or floor diagram uh, must be available <clears throat> to transfer racking loads between bracing walls. Before we go any further, we'll just look at the challenges. Now, we know that when the codes were written back then, the, the houses were very much different to what we get today. Um, now, modern homes, they come with big open areas, taller walls, and larger windows. And they all are uh, kind of negatives to a wall designer. And this results in fewer walls, increased wind loads, and then obviously narrow wall panels. Um, now, in a lower of two-story building, 
where we know the wind force demand can exceed two and a half times the demand of the upper story, the challenge is even greater. So then it becomes often becomes a case of tug of war between the aspirations of the architect or the owner and the challenges imposed on the wall frame designer. Some give and take is in order. And, and this, uh, this presentation is about how we can deal with these challenges. And, uh, and we will look at how designs can be kept within the scope of A1684. And, and then obviously with a little kind of help from the engineer, because there'll be a lot of occasions where we will tend to push the boundaries of A1684. And that's where the engineer can come in and then put the icing on the cake, so to speak. So we'll see uh, what does A1684 say about bracing. There are, there are two, two statements or two sentences given in two areas. One is the clause 613, which is connected to wall framing. Let's talk about temporary and permanent bracing shall be provided. And then, then obviously in the clause eight, which is kind of dedicated to racking forces and bracing, it talks about permanent bracing. Um, and it says permanent bracing shall be provided to enable the roof, wall, and floor framework to resist horizontal forces applied to the building. And then there was a, there's a common statement about connections. I mean, we know that connections in any timber frame applications, connections are something that often gets ignored. And uh, it's, it's the same situation with bracing. And uh, appropriate connections are, are important. And uh, uh, both in clause 613 and clause 8.1, they have repeated the same sentence. I think that's probably giving, giving a bit of emphasis to connections there. Just a couple of photos to ponder on what can happen uh, if, you, if you don't have enough bracing. Not to alarm you, but it's just a couple of photos I picked up from Google. So we'll see what, uh, what uh, clause 831 in 1684 says about wall and subfloor bracing. There are, there are seven steps given, uh, steps A to G. We will discuss four of these steps today, wind classification, bracing systems, especially for walls. I'm, I'll, look, I'll focus more on walls than subfloors. And then also see how these systems are distributed and connected. What we'll not cover today are sections around the calculation of racking forces. Now, this deserves a separate session in its own right. Having said that, that if you, if you ask, ask around the issues that people who are designing, what they, what they would say is that, and also the fact that we looked at the previous uh, slides about challenges, is, about calc is not so much about calculating the force requirement. It's all about how can we get the bracing resistance to work, finding enough walls to brace to resist these forces. So we'll, we'll focus on that part because of that reason. And also, there are industry software available for this purpose. Timber Solutions, it's a pretty old software, we know that, uh, but still, I believe it works. And uh, I, I have tested it recently, and uh, the bracing component is still intact. Um, and also, there are proprietary software from, uh, from nail plate companies and uh, AWP suppliers, of which, will, which will assist with bracing, uh, calculation of bracing forces even if it doesn't look at the bracing resistance side of things, but at least there, is, there are um, avenues to calculate the bracing forces. And also there's an area in A1684, uh, which talks about roof bracing. And it's basically, um, basically the specifications are restricted to timber braces, which as you probably know, that seldom gets used these days. Um, and, because, and, and also the most common application is obviously the diagonal metal bracing, which is unfortunately not covered in A1684. So what the market, the common practice is to use AS4040. Yes, I know it's a, it's a code dedicated to the installation of nail plated timber roof trusses, but the rules still apply for rafters. Uh, we look at wind classification. I think, as I mentioned earlier, there are two pathways provided in A 1684. Clause 142 talks about, talks about the two pathways. One is to use AS4055, which is the wind loading code for house, uh, wind loads for housing code. 
or the, the generic uh, the wind loading code ASN ZS 1175 I will focus a bit on AS4055 because this is a code that has pretty much been designed for even non-engineers to use. It's, uh, it's a very prescriptive uh, uh, standard and it's not that hard to use the standard to assess your own wind classification. Now, and also I mentioned previously that um, there are a couple of uh, geometric uh, limitations which are, uh, which are just uh, governed by the, uh, the loading code you'll be using. So with 4055, the maximum height of 8.5 8 meters, and then the height, uh, which is the you know, simple edge, which is the distance from the average ground level to the underside of eaves, shall not exceed six meters. And also there's another limit, which is uh, exclusive to AS4055, AS which is the length. Length uh, shall not exceed five times the width. Um, whereas the, the width of the building, 16 meter restriction and the roof pitch at 35 degrees is already part of uh, AS1684. And just as, as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, there, is, uh, there, is, uh, there is a uh, very simple approach um, uh, to determine the wind, wind classification through AS4055. Um, it uses four factors uh, for this purpose. And uh, one is the, the wind region, which is, um, it can be A, B, C, or D. You can see from the, from the map here, region A just dominates the whole map. And you find a region B along uh, Brisbane, Queensland, that part uh, around the coast. And then obviously the cyclonic regions of C and D, which are, the, which are colored in blue and light blue and dark blue around the map here. And then the, uh, the other, other factor that it takes into account is, that, is the terrain category, which is the very exposed open terrain being one to a typical suburb being 2.5 or three. So this is based on the density and height of obstruction. And then it looks at topographic classification, which is a measure of the effect of wind on a house on rising ground. T0 being at the bottom of a hill or flat land to T5 being at the top of a steep hill. And then the final one is the shielding classification, which is a measure of the effect of surrounding buildings on the wind speed. Uh, and the full shielding is considered appropriate for a typical suburban development having more than one house per thousand square meters or 10 houses per hectare. Just so remember that sentence because if you, if you look at our typical suburban development, we actually satisfy that rule. So there is an argument to use a full shielding uh, in, in most of our um, kind of, you know, the typical suburban developments. So given the challenges of a modern home, we should now explore ways of creating efficiencies in design. One way is to optimize the loading. In this context, we should ask the question, are we using the right wind classification? Now, our tendency, which is common human tendency, is to use N2 wind classification for most building sites in region A. because the, what, what we have been told is if in doubt, kind of use N2, seems to be the acceptable practice. Or if in doubt, you, you talk to your relevant uh, council and you can ask for the wind classification. However, if you consider typical buildings, as I just mentioned, they are suburban, they're relatively flat. And as, as I said, you can use fully, fully shielding concept. When you, when you take all that into account, you could, you could effectively convert most of the N2 wind, wind regions to N1. So you can see from, uh, this is a table 2.2 from uh, 4055. And we are in a T1 region, say, and if you are in region A, the terrain category of 2.5 or 3, N1, N1 is acceptable. And similarly, if it's a very flat land, you can see that even if you go to fairly open land, in a very flat land, you can use N1. And then what's the advantage? Now, advantage is obviously, as, I, as you can see on the screen, is around 30% reduction on the wind demand. And, and then similarly, when you go into wind region 
D were close to the coast. And even there, sometimes often you use M3 wind, but there are situations where if you, if you dig a bit deeper into AS4055 and use the appropriate uh, factors, you can, you can dig it down to N2 if you, if you have to. So I'm saying this, I'm not to go and convert it tomorrow, but what I'm saying is that, especially when you're faced with challenges and you've got you're desperate to find walls, don't just think about the bracing requirement side of things. Also think about the loading because you, ha you have, you have every, every right to, to optimize the design through, uh, through loading, uh, through uh, you know, like reducing the loads. And another example of how, how loads can be optimized is in the context of a class 1A building. You might have a row of uh, uh, townhouses and, and we know that each unit in these types of buildings must be treated independently, that's a given. And they must be designed for lateral stability in its own right. But the question is, should these units be designed for the worst case, assuming fully exposed windward and leeward walls, especially in direction A, in that direction? Can we make use of a sheltered walls to reduce wind action? These are questions, these are genuine questions that you can ask yourself. And, and then you even talk to an engineer about it. And, the, and in my, my personal opinion, there is an opportunity to reduce the wind loading on the bookend buildings, which are the two ends here, by about 40% because they're sheltered, and a further 15, 20% on the infill using sound engineering principles. Even if you take the argument that if, if the building, building, building adjacent to them doesn't exist, we can also take into account that this, the non-existent of those buildings will be for a short term. So in that case, would you be designing for a 50 year period with that condition? Answer might be no. So there's every, every chance, every uh, opportunity there to consider reducing windows. And I talking to a few engineers, I believe there are, there are a lot of engineers who actually treating it this way. And maybe they said, they, one engineer told me the other day that about 10 years ago, he used, to, he used to design for the worst case, but now with increased challenges, he has got smart in the way he designed it. Now we look at the load part now, because uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the crux of the whole bracing system. And as I said at the start, we will look at, uh, look at what are the components um, of this load path and then try to talk about those components in relation to A1684, rather than trying to go through the clauses of A1684 and try to explain, because this, this gives you a good, um, I would say a good sequence of uh, uh, probably topics I suppose to talk about, which is all interconnected. The horizontal loads are induced on buildings from wind, you can see the loads coming from here, which, we, which must be transferred through the structure to the foundation. So in conventional construction, these loads are transferred to the ground by a complex interaction between the walls, ceiling roof structure, and the floor structure. Starting at the top, wind forces on the roof and top half of the wall are carried through to the ceiling diaphragm, that part. Of it. And then, the wind forces from the bottom half of the upper wall and the top half of the lower wall, along with the wind forces from the ceiling diaphragm, via the brace walls at the, at the top, at the upper wall, are taken to the floor diaphragm. And then the floor diaphragm then will transfer the loads down to the ground through the bracing systems of the lower level. So you can see that there are the load path, uh, load path is complex, especially in a two story structure. And for this load part to work, each element must be connected adequately. So the, so the components that we are talking about or the links of the chain we're talking about here would be elements like the ceiling diaphragm, connection of the ceiling diaphragm to the roof structure, connection of the ceiling diaphragm to the bracing wall, then talk about the bracing wall, then the connections to the floor diaphragm, and then, and then so on. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at all those areas in that context. Just to put it, uh, you know, just to summarize this, these components and links in a schematic form. You can see a single structure, single story is not so complex. And also I was, I've just uh, linked the, or associated the 
relevant clauses in 1684. And then the two story structure is, is a bit more complex. And also there has to be some connectivity between the upper story and lower story, which we'll talk about later. So what are the bracing systems uh, that are available in A1684? Now the code states, horizontal racking forces shall be resisted by a combination of structural wall bracing, which are the cross braces, uh, sheet bracing, et cetera, and also nominal wall bracing. Now, just talking about nominal wall bracing, again, it's something that we tend to ignore. If you, are, if you want to optimize your design, you have every right to use the, use the capability of nominal bracing. Yes, we know the capacities are not much, but the code allows up to 50% of your racking forces to be resisted by this, by nominal. And also it allows, even as a, even, even a wall that is as narrow as 450 milliliters to be deemed effective. So what it, what it means is that there are a lot of redundant walls in the, in the building, which when you add up, say if you have 10 of these 450 millimeters or 600 millimeter walls that have gone unused, you get about three to four kilonewtons of capacity. So, so it all adds up. So I think when you're talking about optimizing design, just think about nominal bracing as well. And we'll look at uh, the structural systems that are given in A1684. Um, I'm referring here mainly to table 8.18, and which I've summarized here. Uh, and first, first we we'll look at um, the four types of metal braces, which are commonly used, still, still used in practice, and uh, supplied by various suppliers, all the nail plate companies supply these products. And there are two angle braces and two tension uh, metal metal strap cross braces with and without strat, strat straps. And when you use strut straps or strut ties, you actually get double the capacity. And, uh, and also uh, the other restriction here is obviously the, it requires a minimum 1.8 meter wall length. And uh, <clears throat> they, are, they are popular because they're cheap and easy to install and they can be used fairly uh, freely within an internal wall system without really impacting plasterboard line. And also, uh, other thing to note, which I'll touch upon later as well, all these capacities in table 8.18 are applicable for 2.7 meter wall heights. So if there are higher wall heights, then some reductions apply, which I'll talk about later. Then table 8.8 uh, specifies sheet bracing as well. So we'll start off with plywood. And there are, there's G, H, I, J, K. There are a few types of plywood uh, uh, bracing, bracing units uh, specified. The J and K are basically decorative, but I don't see that being used in a structural application these days much at all, perhaps in commercial buildings maybe. Uh, so we'll focus more on the J, H, and I, the G, H, and I, I should say. Um, so you find that there, there's a mix of grades and thicknesses. But, but the one that is most commonly used, okay, I'm sure people will agree who are, who are currently in practice, um, is a four millimeter F22 plywood. And the irony is that this is not directly referenced in A1684. So what, what people do here, I mean, even as, as specifiers, you would look at the F14, uh, four millimeters, and then try to, uh, try to use the specifications for F14 four mil and then replace with F F14, F, um, sorry, four millimeter F22, which is a conservative approach, but, but it satisfies the requirements of the code. Now, the other grades and thicknesses specified here are not freely available. Now, with the possible exception of maybe seven millimeters and nine millimeter F8, which you can get fairly easily, uh, but they are more expensive than a four mil uh, F22 plywood, so it's hardly used for that reason. Um, the thin, the three millimeter, four, four and a half millimeter F27 don't exist anymore. And maybe, maybe in future versions of the code, you might see them taken out, I don't know. And also you will notice that uh, if you're familiar with the design capacities from the 2010 edition of the code, you notice that the values have been reduced by 12 and a half percent. And that's because the previous code uh, gave values that are relevant to JD4 framing. And now, which is JD4 framing is a, 
is a rare occurrence on site because people use MGP tents predominantly um, for your wall framing, which is which is uh, classified as JD5. Um, so they they've done the right thing by by bringing it down to the the more predominant uh, value. And then the code now allows you to increase the capacity if you happen to use JD4. So I'll, and I'll go through that later. Um, and also there are a couple of special conditions uh, for plywood. One is um, because as you had seen earlier, plywood, uh, I mean, sheet bracing products, are especially plywood, the, requires a minimum length of 900 millimeters for it to be effective. Anything less than that, uh, will, will, will lead to reduction. So the code allows you to have a 600 millimeter length for, for those units that use a tie down rods at each end. One is obviously the method A on the edge, which, uh, which uses uh, M2L rods at each end, as well as the method I, which is, gives you greater capacity. And that, is, that also, Includes a tie down rod at each end. So those three uh, units are allowed to uh, have 600 millimeter length without any reduction. Whereas uh, it also says that the detail G, which is basically the, the three kilonewton per meter plywood, you can bring it down to 600. You can have a 600 unit. Then what happens is your capacity gets halved. And then you can linearly adjust the capacity between half and one. When you move from 600 to 900. And also it talks about double the capacity as well. The plywood is fixed to both sides and you can use double the capacity. But one thing to watch out for, watch out here is uh, it, it requires a minimum 45 millimeter bottom plane and also additional tie down, tie down requirement is there. Then uh, hardboard, Bracing is also provided in the code LMNN, but hardwood is not commonly available these days. So to my knowledge, there's at least, I think there's one local manufacturer of hardwood, but unfortunately they're not offering this as a basing for that. And uh, so for that reason, and also you find that uh, hardwood is not used much for that reason. Um, again, like plywood, the capacity is of a JD5 now, based on the 2021 code with 16% reduction from the 2010 version. Then you, narrow bracing panels. I think as we discussed at the start, narrow walls are a common occurrence in a modern house. Now, this has become one of the major challenges for a wall designer due to a lack of options available in A1684. The table 8.18 offers only two types of bracing panels for wall length less than 600 millimeters, hardboard types D and E. But as I said earlier, hardwood is not easily accessible, which leaves the designer with no option but to turn to alternate bracing system. So we shall look at some of these sh shortly. There are a few, few available, and uh, we'll go through them shortly. And there are a couple of things that I have to touch upon before we move into uh, alternate bracing systems. The height modification factor. I think I mentioned earlier that table all design capacity, capacities in table 8.18 are based on a 2.7 meter wall height. The wall height is greater than 2.7, the capacity must be reduced relative to the wall height. For example, 3.6 meter wall height will be reduced by a factor of 0.75. And also, again, as I mentioned earlier, the 2021 code now gives the capacity in JD5, so it gives you, uh, gives you the provision to increase capacities if you happen to be using JD4 frame. For instance, MGP12 or LVL framing, then you can increase your capacities by 12.5% if it was plywood sheet or by 16% for hardwood. Okay, now we look at alternate bracing systems. The first cab of the rank is the OSP brace. Now, along with 4 millimeter F22 plywood, uh, OSP dominate the sheet brace market. This product has been in Australia for well over a decade and very well accepted by the builder. Um, you find that reputed suppliers provide sound technical support and offer a simple pathway towards a performance solution. So it's been fairly easily ac uh, accepted by building surveys. And I also noted that many engineers now, they specify OSP in their drawings. 
so it is here to stay. Now, unlike uh, unlike the uh, A1684 options, uh, uh, unlike plywood, I should say, OSB OSB sheet base uh, comes with two two short short wall base options as well. Um, one is the 2.2 kilonewton meter, uh, which which uh, which uses the coach screws at the four corners, or you can increase it to 3.2 kilonewtons by using uh, by using the uh, tied on rods at each end. The second alternative alternate system is the good old portal frame. Now, clause 8367 implies that wear bracing cannot be placed in external walls because of openings, lack of openings, or, or not, not lack of openings, lack of walls because of openings or similar situations. Wall frames may be designed for portal action. So there is an opportunity to design portal uh, design a portal action through plywood. You can you can have plywood around the around the opening and and create some portal action, but there's a bit cumbersome cumbersome design design is involved. But I don't see that being used heavily in Australia. But it can be used. But portal frame is a timber portal frame is probably a more viable option. Um, and there are a couple of timber portal systems that are available in the market these days. Uh, and they can easily cater to the demands of domestic construction. And they typically use 300, 360, or 400 LVL section. And then timber wall trusses are an alternative option for wall lengths between 300 and 600 millimeters. All three uh, nail paid company, uh, companies offer a timber wall truss solution for narrow panels. We have also seen the steel truss space being specified by engineers, uh, attracted mainly by its relatively high capacity. Now, that is where I'll be a little wary because design capacities in the order of 10 to 12 kilonewtons, as you know, within a narrow panel, generate significant tie down demand, as much as 40 to 50 kilonewtons, which is not easy to achieve in typical domestic construction because the builders are not used to handling that kind of uh, tie down. And I think it's fair to say I've been to a few sites where where builders have used these um, steel braces, and guess what? They simply ignore the tie down connection that was required, and they use their use the one that they are more familiar with, which is basically the concrete screws or concrete screw board. There you go. So, but I don't think there is a bit of uh, supervision happening on site or any compliance issues being looked at closely with that kind of thing. Um, and mason revolves is another thing that I that I put put that into the category of alternate system because A1684 does not give any provision for using mason revolves around garages. Yes, the code permits the use of re unreinforced mason revolves to brace subflows with some restrictions, and, and the capacity is given in Table 8.16. But the Australian standards for masonry in small buildings that provide reasonable design capacities for single skin, single level unrestrained bolts, which are typical in a, in a garage of a house, in a house which is a, a, so a garage wall that forms, forms a boundary, often will have a 110 millimeter masonry with engaged fear. Now these walls, we know will be attracting vacuum force, whether they like it or not, because Look, you can't you can't push your racking force uh, distribution uh, the way you like it. So, with the, if there's a diaphragm that exists with the ceiling on the garage, then the loads are going to get transferred to the end. So, in that case, why don't you use it? You know, it's a free hit, really. Um, so, for example, if you look at the capacities, say, for example, in N3 wind, say this is a garage, say. In N3 wind, a six meter wide garage in a single story structure would attract approximately about eight kilonewtons in that direction, uh, which is a racking force. Now, this can be satisfied by a three meter length wall, mason wall, 110, millimeter, 110 wide, engaged piers. And it says, even without restraint from above, now this one will have some restraint from the garage, but even if it didn't have any restraints from above, it can, it can handle 8.3 kilonewtons, which means it can easily satisfy. The uh, wind, wind up to N3, and the, as I said earlier, it gives you a free hit. Now, 
yeah, now we're coming towards to the last last bit of the session. Um, now, ceiling diaphragms. Now, that's the that's something that we identified at the start when we discussed the load load part, the important role the ceiling or the floor diaphragm plays in transferring the horizontal loads to the ground. Now, we know that without an effective diaphragm, the bracing system wouldn't get to perform. Also, as we emphasized before, the diaphragm will be rendered useless if they're not connected adequately. So we discuss connections in detail a little later. And the, and the other factor that, uh, that determines the effectiveness of the, the diaphragm is the depth. Now for its ability to span, just like a beam, larger the depth, bigger is, bigger is the span. Now in that context, we look at the spacing of bracing walls. Now the code, Clause 8367 and 8359, they talk about uh, the spacing requirements or limitations of bracing walls. Um, so we know for the diaphragm to be effective, these, uh, the bracing walls must be spaced within the limit provided in the code. Now, AC, uh, the code provides simple rules for spacing. Uh, this is given as a function of its stiffness, which is the ceiling, ceiling, uh, versus flow, the ceiling flow stiffness is much, uh, much higher than wall stiffness and therefore they can span more for the same depth. And if I summarize the code specifications and you find that, uh, yeah, this is basically a simplified version and uh, the code talks about the nine meter be the maximum, uh, maximum uh, spacing for uh, single, single story, upper or two story, there which is dictated by the stiffness of the ceiling diaphragm. And then when it goes down to the lower of two story, we can even go up to 14 meters because naturally, because of the stiffness being greater. Um, and spacing is one thing, and, and then even distribution of bracing is, uh, is another, which is a important factor for the structural performance of the building. So clause 8366 states, Bracing shall be approximately evenly distributed and provided in both directions. And also says, bracing shall initially be placed in external walls and where possible at the corners of the building. Now, this, state, this statement is appear to be simple and you can argue it's a bit vague. And therefore, the question is, how do you achieve this? Especially when you have a complex layer. Now let us see how we can make even distribution work by adopting a few simple steps. But I don't know, I'm sure many engineers uh, will be using this step. I mean, first step is to distribute bracing by drawing a grid pattern of bracing line in the two directions. So here I've taken a bit of a complex one. This, I, I got this diagram from uh, JIB New Zealand. There, there's some good information in, uh, in New Zealand uh, with regard to ceiling diaphragms and bracing uh, and, and flow diaphragms. Um, so you can see uh, in each direction, it, it built, uh, it's split into um, bracing lines and they don't have to be equal they, because they're dictated by where the bracing walls are placed. But what, what it does is that you'll be able to distribute the loads onto these bracing lines on merits. So what it does is that if, if you have 50 kilonewtons, then it will look at what the width of the spacing between the walls are and then equally a portion the right value to those grid lines. And from there, we know then each of those grid lines will, the bracing uh, units or the bracing walls in those grid lines will have to take that load, the load that's been apportioned there. And what it does then, two things. One is it will, by, by default, you will satisfy the even distribution method. And also when you're looking at the spacing of bracing walls, it will also um, make that wall, because you, you can ask the question, what constitutes a bracing wall when you talk of uh, the spacing? Because you can't have a bracing wall with one kilonewton capacity and say, okay, and I can support, support my diaphragm on that wall. No, you can't, because there has to be a logic to it. So this grid line method actually gives you that logic as well to make the ceiling diaphragm more effective. And then uh, quickly go through a couple of things here. The external bracing, uh, this one, um, the code talks about bracing walls can be on the ends of the, 
uh, in Zawibs, and there is uh, the clause 836 that covers that. Then the question is, can, can diaphragms can cleave? Of course they can, as are uh, considered to be deep, as they're considered to be deep horizontal beams. So the sim similar rules to beams will apply. And, uh, you know, the, that is the non cantilevered section has to be at least three times the cantilever. And obviously, they have to be, it has to be continuous as well. So if there are discontinuity, then, then it may not be effective. But when you talk about discontinuity, just, just be mindful that discontinuity within um, where you get uh, internal, internal wall junctions and so on are generally ignored because you get some continuity through your, uh, through your cornices and things like that. Can they be raked? Yes, they can. A1684 figure 8.1 note 2 infers that ceiling diaphragms can be installed on the rake, as would be typical in a cathedral or exposed rafted roof construction. Can diaph di uh, diaphragms have holes? Yes, small holes or discontinuities in internal walls, they do not impact the effectiveness of diaphragm. But a large hole is introduced around stairwells or entry voids, the diaphragm can still be made effective if the discontinuity is allowed for. Now, this can be achieved by using the net depth, in this case here, the net depth here of the diaphragm to work out the spacing between the bracing walls. So if, if that net depth is 4.8 meters, then obviously this can span nine meters. And so if the connections are inadequate or the spacing of bracing walls exceed A1684 limit, then clause 148 allows alternate systems designed and approved by an engineer. So we can consider either a wind beam, which I'm sure a lot of people use them along stair voids and so on, but in a, in a, roof, uh, in a roof ceiling application, they can be used on the flat and made, made far more efficient. And, but when it comes to long spans, then obviously wind trusses, which, is, which has been used for a very long time, in the good old days, they were used in bridges and so on as well. So, um, and commercial buildings, I mean, they're very common there. So we can use them as, as one solution. And our other solution is obviously designing an engineered uh, plywood diaphragm uh, or steel cross space system. So there are, there are documents available for that. And we're going to connections here, uh, mentioned earlier, all these connections, typical. So with, with the ceiling connections, um, you find that, um, Metal furring channels using a clip system, they don't, um, they, are, they are not, uh, they, they don't give you an effective uh, diaphragm or suspended ceilings don't give an effective diaphragm either. Um, connection to the top of bracing walls, the ceiling floor diaphragm uh, is required to be fixed to the tops of bracing walls to enable rack in loads to be transferred to all bracing walls, including internal bracing walls. So table 822 gives typical details and shear capacity. And they can be used in combination as well. They don't have to be located directly above the basing units, but they can be uh, they can be away from the basing units, and they can be used as a combination to achieve the capacity. And the only only criteria there is the top plate has to be continuous to make sure the loads get transferred. And and even a load bearing wall, of course, you don't use shear connectors there, but the natural tie down connectors will actually take care of the shear connection requirement. Um, and then if, if you need larger larger loads and there are other, other products to use. Uh, and in terms of shear connectors, um, because the, the most common one used in the past is the timber shear blocks, but there are, there are new products available in the market now. You can talk to the respective uh, companies who actually supply them. Um, then the bottom of bracing walls, this is last, uh, last section, the bottom of bracing walls. Um, they, they have to be tied down, obviously, because otherwise you'll get issues like again, overturning and then wall deforming. And, and this is important. Now, bracing units up to 3.4 kilonewton per meter, they, they only require nominal bracing. You don't have to worry about any uh, special bracing conditions there. Whereas uh, table 8.18 provides uh, details of specific fixing, and that's, that's there for high, high capacity bracing units. Um, and then there was a there was reference to a 13 kilonewton connector earlier uh, in, the, in the previous slide. Uh, you see the, there is sort of special 13 kilonewton connections been referred to there. And 
and then we look at uh, how we can achieve that. Now, the code gives uh, many options uh, when it comes to fixing into timber flows, but not so much into, into concrete. The casting cast in bolt option is not very common here. I mean, maybe it's probably common in Queensland and North Queensland, but the most common application here is uh, using a concrete screw bolt to achieve this. And then there is also um, the, um, a table given 8.23, which is there to cater to um, fixings that are outside table 8.18. If, if you're having a special bracing unit, then you can refer to this table to work out what the tie down demand is. And also the connections are given in table 8.24. A few details are given. The other thing, uh, as I mentioned at the start, is the flow within the flow depth. Uh, there has to be sufficient uh, fixings there. I think most, most flow system suppliers, they, they provide these kind of um, specifications and they're based on some standard rules without really having a knowledge of the bracing requirement. Um, but these rules tend to work reasonably well for bracing units up to three kilometers meter. The last uh, topic I just want to mention is temporary bracing. Um, clause 8.2 requires temporary bracing to be installed to provide stability to the house so that it can resist wind and construction loads during, con during construction. Um, and the critical part there is the most vulnerable time during construction is when the roof is clad, but the walls still have no external or internal cladding installed. So how do we deal with it? Now, code, code says have equal to at least 60% of the permanent bracing required. So I think there are the there's a A1684 guide which I'll just mention quickly. Um, for single upper story and for lower story, they I think thing, especially lower story structures, before you install your wall frame, make sure your lower level walls have got the full permanent bracing installed and fully fixed. And but for more for more reading, refer to the A1684 user guide. There are there are many uh, A1684 user guides, I think up to 10, and they provide uh, very good commentary on some of the important areas of the code. If you haven't read, read these already, I strongly encourage you to do so. And these are available for download from the Wood Solutions website. That's it from me. And now we can just want to uh, look at some takeaway points quickly. Um, scope and challenges. We said most modern buildings push the scope boundaries of A1684. However, with a little help from the engineer, we can deal with most challenges. And when it comes to wind actions, there are two pathways available. We have seen how wind loading can be optimized using the appropriate data. Under bracing systems, it's viable alternative systems available, namely OSB, timber portal frames, and timber wall truss braces to complement A1684 specifications and meet the modern challenges of narrow panels. Uh, distribution and connections, the load path requires all components to play its role. We, we have, uh, I think we emphasized a lot on that. And obviously temporary bracing deserves much greater attention than currently given. Most site failures are a result of little or no temporary bracing. And once the building is fully braced, we hardly see any issues. Minor movements can happen, but not collapses. But without temporary bracing, we see collapses. That's my final word. And thank you very much for your attention. Well done, Afsal. That's a very detailed topic. You've done that very well at uh, getting through all that uh, uh, detail. Um, so, look, we do have a, a few questions, Afsal, and uh, some of them are, are right in your um, in your area uh, with your past frame and truss experience. So, this first one was an interesting question about um, uh, people are sort of find uh, sorry, there's some delays in getting uh, timber trusses to site, and this person is saying that. Um, some builders have commenced manufacturing timber trusses on site and, and what are your views and how can it be approved? So it's um, not a quite a 1684 question, but an interesting one uh, with all uh, material uh, supply difficulties across all uh, materials and, and products, um, uh, addressing um, uh, uh, manufacturing of, of trusses on site. Um, what, what's your views there? Right, okay, that's a, that's a completely a different question to the topic here. Uh, <laughs> all I can say is that talk to your, talk to your nail plate companies. I think there are, there are good engineers working for those companies and they'll, they'll provide the right advice. And that's my question because you have to, when you're, when you're dealing with trusses, you have to go to the experts and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they will give you the right information, and especially making trusses 
on site that used to be done in the good old days when you had knuckle nail plates and so on. But but due to due to efficiencies and other reasons, people have people have stopped doing that. But I can understand why why they are gone back to doing it. But uh, I can say just be careful if you're doing that. Talk to your nail plate company uh, engineer from a nail plate company, and they will give you the right advice. Yeah, look, I think that's probably where I was thinking, uh, Afzal, as well, that, you know, I'd hate to be thinking that there are people on site manufacturing trusses using nail plates and using hammers and bashing things together. So that was mainly the reason why I thought I'd raise that, you know, that people need to be very careful with these engineered products that they don't think they can just go on site and manufacture them themselves. Um, uh, one, one in relation to using 1684, Afzal, but um, uh, putting a light timber frame on top of an existing block of units, say, so if there's an existing three-storey block, can we still use 1684 for the next level being placed on top of the block? Um, I think uh, first thing is in terms of uh, if, 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 it, uh, uh, if it if it doesn't comply with the with the height of the building, because especially when you're talking about the, uh, the the wind classification method, if it exceeds eight and a half meters, then obviously then you can use AS 1720. Oh, sorry. AS 1170 part two to design the wind. Uh, so once you design those uh, wind aspects, then there's no limit. You, you, you can, once you work out the wind forces based on 1170, because it, it's unlikely to be within the scope of AS 4055, then, then I don't see a problem that, mm. uh, that you can design. Yeah. What's your opinion on that, Boris? Yeah, look, I, I agree. Look, it can be done, but you can't just take 1684 as it is and just say, yeah. I'm going to design a, a, a building uh, to the highest wind classification, just stick it on top without actually knowing what the winds are. Um, and then the, it's the tying down as well. So the higher we get up um, in terms of the building height, the further we're getting away from ground level, where we've got a lot of that, um, uh, what's the word for it, uh, interruption in terms of wind flow. So the higher up you go, the more you get the direct wind, so the more force. So you've got to be very careful. You don't just automatically think, you know, I'm going to build a frame to 684 and put it on top. There's yeah. a lot of pre-work, as Afstyle's saying, is making sure that the wind is appropriate and you'd have to use 1170 part two uh, for, for that. Um, but yeah, uh, once you've got all that sorted out, then you could look to 684 for potential solutions because the brace capacity for your wall will be the same if it's in the air or down the bottom in terms of your sheet capacity or your, or your diagonal bracings. That won't change, but it's the the wind force on, on the structure that will change. So um, the, another interesting one, so also with your uh, background uh, comment um, or the question being asked is um, with, with the uh, metal angle braces um, with external walls, um, is it a requirement that they cut into the wall studs with the, the angles, the, the metal angle brace? Yes, yes, they are meant to, meant to be cut in by I think 20 millimeters, the code allows yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, because code doesn't allow you to have notches on successive studs, but they give an exception for the diagonal, diagonal angle braces. And yes. uh, it also good practice is for the vertical leg to be facing downwards, because you don't want the vertical leg to be faced upwards, because it can be an OHNS hazard. And the practice would be to, uh, to have the leg pointing downwards. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try and answer this one, uh, Afzal. It's about um, using structural wall uh, bracing in termite resistant areas if you have a treated frame. Uh, so the question is, you know, can you use or um, must the sheet bracing uh, be termite resistant as well uh, when you're using a termite frame? So I suppose the, the quick response would be if you're using a termite treated or a, a preservative treated frame to resist termite uh, attack, then that's, that's your primary um, design approach, then your bracing would also need to, to be treated and you can purchase uh, treated um, uh, structural um, brace uh, product. I, I agree. I was being pliable. I agree. I think uh, with, the, with the OSP that's in the market, predominantly they come, come with an H2, uh, H2S treatment. Yeah. So, yeah. They're treated. so that's, a, that's no brainer because it's a timber product after all. And the, if there's a requirement for the timber to be treated, then the bracing has to be treated as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's uh, one uh, a question in, in relation to um, uh, the, the stiffness of the of the ceiling diaphragm. Um, so is, is plasterboard considered an effective diaphragm? And I think you know, from from the presentation, yeah. 684 does recognise uh, that um, as a as a system. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, Afsar. Yeah, no, no, that's correct. I think uh, the the limits given in A1684 
are based on testing done on plasterboard uh, ceiling. So yeah. the nine meters. So if you, you can argue that if you use stiffer one like plywood, but you had to but part of design it using engineer principle, then you you can span longer. Yes. So, no. so yeah, plasterboard yeah. is is recognized absolutely. Yeah. But then but then there there the uh, important thing there Boris is the connection because these days a lot of the plasterboard ceilings are connected through pouring channels and they fit yes. on. And yeah. when you do that, it doesn't matter what sheeting you use, it's, it's not going to be effective. So yeah. the connection to me is, is far, more, far more important in that context. No, you're very, very right. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Afsal. You, know, um, you did talk about those sort of, um, let's call them suspended ceilings that are not directly fixed. I mean, in, in the old days, we used to direct fix uh, the yes. plasterboard now we're using all these furring channels and, and clip systems so that's Correct. that's a different scenario uh, that needs to be very closely considered uh, in the design so look up so we, we've actually um uh, reached our, our midday um uh, close off so i'll hand back to alistair so thanks again us no worries thank you very much and uh, sort of thanks for uh, thank the attention Bruce. i should say yeah and so I would remind you all that um, these sessions are recorded. If you'd like to um, relook at this or let your colleagues know about it, simply go to the uh, that page on our Wood, Wood Solutions website. Also remind you that there'll be one more in this series on AS 684, which will be around tight ends and connections held on Tuesday, 7th of June with uh, Tim Rosser from MyTech presenting that. So please uh, register for that. You can register that now on our website. And just a reminder of um, our webinar in two weeks' time. Um, we're very fortunate to have Professor Jeff Morell, who's very known, well known globally, an international expert in durability, and he runs our National Dur Durability Sam Timber Durability Centre up in Queensland. And he'll be talking about all the great projects that they've been undertaking over the last four years. So, if you have an interest in durability, um, please tune in for that one. So, thank you once again, everyone. Uh, we'll see you again in two weeks' time, and have a great day. Bye.